Our first reading is from Psalm 110, which is on page 611 of the Church Bibles. So that's page 611, Psalm 110, starting at verse 1. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of your wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Hebrews chapter 13, starting at verse 20, and that can be found on page 1214. Hebrews chapter 13, beginning at verse 20. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. You should know that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom... I shall see you if he comes soon. Greet all your leaders and all the saints. Those who come from Italy send you greetings. Grace be with all of you. Well, thank you, Paul, very much indeed for reading. Uh, my name is Tim. I thought I'd wor it's worth mentioning that in case we've not met before, I serve on the staff team here, especially with students. And let me tell you a little bit about what's been going on in my flat for the last few weeks. My, flat is a, uh, my flatmate is a massive fan of the Tour de France. I've been learning all about it as a result. And uh, it turns out it is, if you don't know, a competition that runs over 21 stages, almost every day for three weeks, a couple of rest days, touring France. I don't have much French, but I think I've worked out why it's called what it is. And uh, they go around lots of different bits of France, some exhausting climbs up the mountains, uh, lots of winding roads, and some, bra um, some bracing sprints to win the right to wear the coveted yellow jersey. It is, in fact, finishing as we speak. The fact you are here means you're probably not a big Tour de France fan, uh, but it's an illustration that's going to run through this talk, so please just embrace it for the moment. Um, it's a demanding competition, so demanding that many of the 184 riders who started have had to drop out. Maybe you saw on the first day the news of one of the worst crashes in the competition's history, when a woman was holding a cardboard sign, Hi Granny and Grandpa in German, not facing the riders as they approached from behind, and one of them got whacked in the face, a whole load of them uh, piled up behind. It's uh, the sort of thing that I, <laughs> I mean, I'd be done. I'd give up. Three more weeks of cycling after you've been through that, no thanks. But apparently most of them managed to keep going. Two of them were out because of their injuries. And yet over the course of these three weeks, a further 40 have had to step back from the competition. 184 started, but 42 in the end have dropped out. It's an extraordinary race to be a part of, but not everybody makes it to the finish. That's a striking illustration of the Christian life, isn't it? An extraordinary race to be a part of, but not everybody makes it to the finish. Uh, two months ago, when we began our series, Hebrews 12 picked up that metaphor of a race. Just flip back a page and look at Hebrews 12, verse 1. 
Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. The whole book has warned us about dropping out of this race before we reach it to the end, before we reach the end, laying down this constant challenge, will you make it? And that seems to be the question the writer to the Hebrews wants to ask his readers. We've seen that they were actually quite a good church. They'd got lots of things right in the past. They'd endured persecution. They'd endured a struggle with uh, with suffering, we're told. They'd had compassion on those in prison. They were the David and Gabor of their church back in the day, involved in the prison ministry, joyfully accepting the plundering of their property. That's not a comment on David and Gabor, uh, but certainly what they'd gone through. And now, well, now they were in need of strong warning. Uh, Chapter 5 speaks of them as spiritual infants. Frequently, he tells them not to fall away, not to give up on Jesus. It's It's as though he's asking the question, will you make it? I don't know what stage you're at this afternoon, how far you've got left to go. I guess the students will be the youngest amongst us, will feel like there are decades to come, as some of us have got slightly less, even if we make it uh, into our 80s. But whether you've just got going, or you've been going for a while, or maybe you're looking in on Christian things and wondering whether you want to join the race, here's the challenge of the book of Hebrews. Will you make it to the end? Uh, When the cardboard signs of life whack you in the face, Will you be one of those who drop out? You don't have to be long as a Christian uh, before you'll see others give up. In fact, I find Hebrews an especially difficult book to read sometimes because it is the book I was reading with a student once when he chose to walk away. And it leaves me asking that same question. Will I make it to the end? When I consider the challenges that might come my way, when I think of last week's call to go to Jesus outside the camp, when I think about all that's coming in the rest of this race, I find myself asking, will I make it? But as this book draws to a close, we're given, us, we're given these verses to leave us with real hope. There's something of a prayer for us this evening, an appeal to God, and its purpose is that we would pray it, but particularly that as we look at this race, from the perspective of this prayer, it might leave us with confidence for the road ahead. Two points for us to look at this evening. If you've not already spotted it, there's a handout to help you on your way, and I think we'll keep to the handouts. That's exciting. Point one there, the God who established his promise. Let me read from verse 20 again. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Hebrews has been filled with fridge verses, hasn't it? You know, there's verses that you should write and put up on the fridge or you put in a friend's card if they're a Christian and want to encourage them. Uh, These would be brilliant verses to commit to memory, but especially because they are pregnant with the rich theology of this book of Hebrews. God brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus. A Jesus has been raised. And that language of being brought again apparently literally means leading up from a lower to a higher place. Because... In the whole of Hebrews, the theme of Jesus' resurrection is consistently tied to his going back to heaven and to take up his throne. It is the theme that we've been thinking about, actually, all the way through this evening. One Hebrew scholar puts it like this, Jesus' resurrection is usually subsumed under the image of his exaltation to God's right hands. A God brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, is a reminder that he's resurrected and ascended and reigning as king. It is our theme from this evening. And in fact, it's the theme from the whole book, really. The the writer to the Hebrews has constantly been pointing us to that by frequently quoting Psalm 110, that psalm we just had read to us. Uh, Please flip back to it or look at the other uh, page of the handouts if you've lost it. You'll see there Psalm 110, a song from the Old Testament 
which promised that God's king would be raised to his right hand. It's a song about Jesus' ascension. In fact, two particular verses to pull out. Firstly, in verse 1, the king is invited to sit at God's right hand until he makes his enemies his footstool. And then down at verse 4, the king is appointed as a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, if you didn't recognize those when they're being read in Psalm 110, you might start to realize that they're actually there all the way through Hebrews. Constantly, the writer picks up those two elements, sitting and priest. So uh, don't look all these up, but they're written on the handout. 1 verse 3, Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. 1 verse 13, an explicit quote, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. 5 verse 6, you're a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. 5 verse 10, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And so on and so on and so on. Sitting priest, priest sitting all the way through. There's some stuff that isn't Psalm 110, but it's basically all the way through the book. Hebrews is like a massive sermon telling us that Jesus has been raised, and so Psalm 110 has been fulfilled. In fact, that's basically what he says in 8 verse 1. Uh, This one is worth looking up. Uh, Hebrews chapter 8 verse 1. Now the point in what we are saying is this. It's always great when a Bible writer puts that there. Always helpful for telling you what he's talking about. The point in what we're saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. Psalm 110 is massive in this book. And here again at the book's close, the writer reminds us that God brought Jesus back from the the dead. And if all that doesn't make you jump with delight, well, consider what it means. God brought Jesus back from the dead to sit at his right hand. So you and I know who is on the throne of the universe. And wonderfully, it is none of the tyrants who you might fear is in charge, but rather it is Jesus upholding the universe by the word of his power. It is Jesus. Nothing happens without his say-so. More than that, God brought Jesus back from the dead to sit there on our behalf as priest. God placed him at his right hand so that Jesus could intercede for us. That is, so that he could pray for us. So that Jesus would always have the ear of the Father on our behalf. And to assure us that when we find ourselves overwhelmed with temptation... He is ready to offer mercy and grace. And here's the question. If you've struggled to follow so far, don't worry, this one's an easy one. Who did all of this? Have a look at chapter 13, verse 20. Who did all of this? Verse 20, God. God did it. That's nice and easy, isn't it? Now, those who've got exams at some point over the summer or in the coming years, you can hope for a question as easy as that. But of course, fulfilling the promise that God has fulfilled, that was n- anything but easy. In fact, it cost nothing less than signing a new contract in his own blood. 13 verse 20 again, The God of peace brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant. That is, for Jesus to take up his priest-king role required a whole new agreement, a new covenant that cost Jesus his life. God had to make a new contract and sign it in his blood. Up until Jesus, God had related to his people through a temporary agreement, what we call the Mosaic Covenant. It was an agreement that appointed the descendants of Aaron to be priests. But Jesus represents a change in the priesthood, as chapter 7 puts it, Uh, And as chapter 7 puts it, when there's a change in the priesthood, there's necessarily a change in the law as well. For Jesus to become priest king, it needed a whole new contract. But that's exactly what God has drawn up. Uh, Through the prophet Jeremiah, amongst many other prophets, he promised a new covenant. And not just to change the priesthood, I guess that bit for us doesn't seem to capture our attention so much, but think of the other things God changed with the new covenant. Uh, The first agreement was plagued with problems because it didn't deal with the problem of our sin. But this new covenant actually did deal with sin, providing 
real, lasting forgiveness, and it would go on forever. Not like the temporary covenant, uh, the one that was passing away. No, this one was eternal. The eternal covenant. Of course, this was always what God was going to do. He planned it from eternity past. He didn't have to rewrite his plans. But the way he describes it to us in the Bible is as a new contract to replace the old. An eternal covenant to replace the temporary one. And Hebrews shows us what that costs. As it picks up that Jeremiah promise, it tells us that bringing in the new covenant costs nothing less than the blood of Jesus in order to start this new covenant and appoints Jesus as the eternal priest king, Jesus had to die. And as he died on the cross, given over as a sacrifice to stand in our place, the new covenant began. His blood sealed the agreement. It paved the way for him to become the priest king and for our whole new relationship to begin between God and his people. Hebrews 9 verse 12. I put this really helpfully. One of the student workers, Katie, pointed my attention to this earlier in the week. Jesus entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. It's the same idea there as we've got in chapter 13. God raised the Lord Jesus by the blood of the eternal covenant. That is, he made Jesus the eternal priest king by writing a new contract in his blood. If you're falling asleep at this point on a hot evening, then take this moment to wake yourself up and consider what a huge thing it is. How much God has poured into making this coronation possible. It is extraordinary, isn't it? We're used to people pouring a lot in to try and accomplish something. At the moment, the best illustration of this I could come up with was the Olympics. Maybe you've seen that bit on BBC News of Adam Peaty, the British swimmer, uh, talking about everything he's been pouring in over the last few months to try and get, um, get to the Olympics and to defend his, his gold medal. Uh, early starts, constant discipline, uh, unrelenting focus on that goal. In fact, there's a whole team uh, together who are working at it. His coach, uh, his girlfriend, his partner is there as well. And nobody questions how committed he is, how much he's pouring in. In fact, uh, he goes as far as to say, in my head, I would rather die than lose. Do you see what he and the whole team are willing to pour into it? I'd rather die than lose. And yet God wasn't just ready to do that. He did it. I would rather die than lose is carved forever into Jesus' nail-pierced hands. And the key thing for us this evening is that God did it alone. No team around him. If history gave receipts, then there'd only be one name at the bottom, paid in full by God. Psalm 110 was ultimately an extraordinary promise to establish an eternal priest king, required a new contract, signed in blood. It was an inexpressible cost, and God did it. God did it alone. Without your help, without your contribution, you weren't a coach there alongside to kind of chivvy him on, not a girlfriend to one side to give him emotional support. He established his promise, which is crucial for us to realize, crucial when we start to think about the Christian life. Because if God is the one who's done everything so far, then he is the one that we need to trust to get us across the finish line. Point two on the handouts, the God who established his promise equips his people. Let me read from verse 20 again. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Doing God's will and that which is pleasing in his sight, we could come up with loads of ideas for what they mean. 
that Hebrews itself gives us some pointers and always seems to connect them, connect them to the idea of faith. I flip back to chapter 10, verse 36, and you'll see doing God's will there. 1036, for you have need of endurance so that when you've done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while and the coming one will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. You see the parallel there between doing the will of God and living by faith? The will of God seems to be that we'd live by faith. In fact, as he goes on to talk about faith over the next few verses, he also brings up that idea of being pleasing to God. 11 verse 5, just below there, by faith Enoch was taken up so that he could not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it's impossible to please him. Doing God's will and doing what is pleasing to God. They seem to have been connected to the idea of living lives of faith, which would make sense, doesn't it? The big challenge of the Christian life is not that we do loads of good things, that we reform enough of society or we perform enough good works, but that we keep putting our faith in Jesus. It's about whether we'll keep trusting Jesus, going to him outside the camp, taking up our cross and following him. The life that God calls us to, that he desires of us, that pleases him, is the life of faith. But even as we discover what it is that God wants for us, it's easy for us to start thinking that it's all about us, that God's accomplished his part of the bargain and now we've got to do our part. But the point the writer is making is that whatever God might require of us, he is the one who equips us. Verse 21, may God equip you with everything good that you may do his will. Of course, the verse doesn't tell us anything about how God equips us. Again, we can get some pointers from earlier in Hebrews. Uh, uh, some things that are sort of fertilizers of faith, uh, the food that helps faith to grow, uh, things like the Bible. Uh, That might sound like just one of those things I say because I'm a St. Helens preacher, but it's actually been there all the way through Hebrews. I see that you don't refuse him who's speaking. Uh, What else have we had? We had, we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard. Uh, We have God's word. We also have each other, uh, other Christians, the church around us. And we heard that constantly as well. Exhort one another every day as long as it's called today. Don't neglect to meet together, but encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. Even just this evening as we gather, we get to experience some of the great fertilizers of faith. And it's a reminder that this passage is not just saying, let go and let God, uh, relax, don't do anything, be passive, forget about the instructions of the Bible. And yet, the big emphasis of this prayer, uh, the big concern of this prayer, is who we're relying on. And it's a reminder not to rely on ourselves. I guess we need to hear that, don't we? So vulnerable to think that, that, that God did his bit and I need to do mine. For some of us with self-confidence, I'm going to do my bit, yeah, I'll be fine. For some of us with panic, I'm never going to manage this. But all of us have that temptation to start focusing on our own performance. Asking ourselves how well we're doing at standing with Jesus outside the camp. Or assessing how we're doing on our Bible reading or our evangelism. In all those cases, that's looking in the wrong direction. It's focusing our gaze in the wrong place. Here is a reminder not to focus on ourselves. And it's a reminder not to focus on, not to rely on others. Yes, as I said, we need to encourage one another. Keep meeting together. That's good and important. And last week we were told to have confidence in our leaders. Yes, that's right. But ultimately, we can't rely on them to get us over the finish line. We're all sinners here. I take it that's why the writer includes himself in verse 21. Did you spot that? Verse 21, he says, God will equip equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. The eagle-eyed will see that some manuscripts say you, but... Apparently, the most reliable ones say us. The writer includes himself. You can't rely on others. You can't rely on yourself. Nor can we rely on the past. 
And I guess this is one that we're particularly vulnerable to, isn't it? I'm at St. Helens, so of course I'm going to make it to the end. Look at my Christian CV. Look at all these things I've done before. The Hebrews had a much more impressive Christian CV than you or I had. They were persecuted, they were imprisoned, their property was plundered for their faith, and they joyfully accepted it. And yet they still needed this book. You know, we can't rely on ourselves, or on others, or on our past, but we can rely on God. He is the one who established his promise and who equips his people. Indeed, he has done time and time again. You see it throughout the Bible. That's why I love that little note, that nod towards Timothy in verse 23. A great name, Timothy, by the way, in case you're looking for baby names. I think entirely impartially, it's an excellent name. Uh, But verse 23 there, you should know that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom I shall see you if he comes soon. Timothy, one of the Christians of the background of so much of the New Testament, plugging away when others seem to be giving up. And here's a little glimpse of something that happened later on in his life. When you're reading the book of 2 Timothy, as I know some of us have done, maybe you're on the camping trip last week, hearing that letter written to Timothy. Well, here's something that happened after that. He got imprisoned, presumably for the gospel, for going to Jesus outside the camp. But there he is, still trusting Jesus at the end of his sentence, equipped by God to keep going in his faith. God is the one who can provide us with everything we need. And that's why he gets the glory at the end of verse 21. At the end of verse 21, to whom be glory forever and ever. Of course, he gets the glory, not us. He is the one who's done everything. Everything to establish his promise. And so the one that we can trust to get us across the finish line. England football supporters have had the painful experience last week of seeing one who couldn't get us over the finish line. For all the good that Gareth Southgate did with the England men's football team, he couldn't deliver the trophy, and it meant heartache for many, many of us, I guess. In fact, when I was discussing this illustration with some of the student team earlier this week, one of them threatened to stand up at this point and go, too soon! But she's not here, so I've got away with it. But if you are feeling the anguish of England's loss, well, harness that pain. If you shed a tear for England's loss last week, won't you weep for those who have abandoned the faith? If it was upsetting to reach the final and not win the trophy, how much worse to get so far in the Christian life and then not make it over the line? Aren't you worried that it might be you? If you're not worried about being one of them, then reread Hebrews. It should trouble us. It should trouble us unless we're trusting the one far greater than Gareth Southgate to get us over the line. It should trouble us unless we are trusting God, the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant. A God who did all of that. We can trust him to equip us with everything good that we may do his will. Working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. We can take great confidence as we look on to the most important finish line that exists. The Tour de France is finishing right now. Or probably has finished now. No spoilers, please. 184 riders began, at least 42 of them dropped out without making it to the end. I don't know how many of us will drop out of the Christian faith, but I know how to avoid being one of them. It's the prayer of Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21. Are these final verses that remind us to set our eyes on Jesus, indeed on God who brought him again from the dead by the blood of the eternal covenant, to depend on God to equip us to lead lives of faith. Now, these aren't magic words, there's nothing special about them in that sense, but they point us away from ourselves and on to him.
to the one who has done everything to establish his promise. And so the one we need to depend on for everything that's left. Our last song in a moment will give voice to that expression of trust in God. But as we close, would you join me in reading these two verses as a prayer to God together? Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21. Let's say these together. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good, that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.